suddenly changed pace through the centre. It's Burkamp. That's magnificent. The move, and then this, which left Dabby's ass totally stranded. Hello and welcome. We are a Burkett Wonderland and we're also an Arsenal podcast. My name is Chris. I'm your host for this evening's affairs. We're quite happy at the moment. We're quite happy. We're, 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 we're having lovely times in the sunshine. Well, sun's kind of gone, but you know, we were having a lovely time in the sunshine at the weekend and we're still loving life as we are currently top of the league. I say we, not me, Josh and Carl, the Arsenal. But I will introduce Josh and Carl because we're going to talk about the Arsenal. So uh, first, in the top right-hand corner, a little under the weather tonight, I think it's fair to say, Josh. Um, are you close to death? Are you in the red zone? Are you somewhere in between? What's 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 the deal? I think what it is, is I'm just feeling dizzy from Arsenal being top of the league after three games. We've not been like that for a while. Um, yeah, the best of us. otherwise, I am persevering through like the trooper I am. Um, what can I say? It's because Judas has left us. And I'm sure we'll speak about, um, and sure Dan, uh, well, Carl will speak about he who should not be named, um, deciding to miss what is it? This a second one in the row? Um, are we, are we, are we, yeah, we, we're referring to the fat man here, PHA. We, we are Judas, yes, Ju- Judas, yes, yes, uh, isn't Judas. he moonlighting? Carl, yeah, it's elsewhere. <laughs> seen, seen as you spoke up there, Carl. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what. What do we know? Didn't he say he was going to the pub or something for dinner? Like he's becoming all social and shit. I don't. I don't. I'm not comfortable with Danny in in society. Yeah, thoughts, Carl? Um, you know, surely he should have to sign some sort of register when he leaves. <laughs> what register that is, I let you like decide. But um, I'm not touching that. Or he should what be on some sort of. He should be on some sort of leash that like, can only go so far, and mm. then we have to wind his chair back in, like because yeah, yeah. Danny being your social is not good for, I mean, not good for us, uh, obviously, but society as a whole. You know, no one wants to see Danny outside. No, Loki's out with him though. He's on another pod. So I mean, mm. that's uh, to be fair, that's even worse. I mean, you know, literally leaving behind his own bread and butter to to moonlight somewhere else. That's that's poor, it's poor behavior. What I we mean... need. Is, is Danny's chair? Do you remember? Do you remember in the late eighties, early nineties, and remote control cars before Bluetooth, and they had like a wire on them, and, mm. and you had to. That's what we need. That's that's what we need. Go on, Josh. Yeah, I was going to say it's something similar to that, or um, you know, other people on this podcast have been known to moonlight on other podcasts, but we never did it on the day of ABW. Thank you. That's all I'm saying. Yes, we've never done I... it then. I, I am host of another podcast, but I always I'm do just, it on a Monday, and I always do it to this one. Danny could we could put Danny out on loan. The transfer window is still open, and we are True. open to bids. I mean, what do you say? Packet of hobnobs? <sighs> half, half a packet out there, or actually, no, not even half a packet. You know, like when you drop them, and then there's that sort of collection of just crumbs in the bottom when you get to the last biscuit. That kind of yeah, or or the biscuit that yeah. breaks in the tea. You know, one of those. I feel like we're going um, to peace here a little bit, but um, you know, that's fine. That that's fine, you know. We've got the Danny slander out of the way. Uh let's let's talk about where we're actually here, which is of course Arsenal. So let's get into it, gents. We've got a lovely fragrant menu for you this evening, which I shall launch into immediately. Carl, I shall come to you first of all, sir. We went to Brentford, uh, Brentford, we, we did that a few weeks ago, no, last season. We went to Bournemouth, all the bees, and we see what I did there. <laughs> didn't even mean to we went to Bournemouth in the sunshine on a Saturday night I think all of us were we said on this podcast last week we needed to keep the the momentum going we needed to keep the the three points coming in and a performance wouldn't have gone amiss either we got both what was your overall thoughts on an unchanged lineup and a, a delicious victory on the south coast I mean it had everything written in it didn't it, it had you know down by the seaside Saturday evening, sun setting. It was just like if you could have asked for a perfect game, it would have been that. Maybe not at um 
Bournemouth's ground, but because it's like tiny, but it was just everything you wanted, sun shining, by the sea, just lovely. And I think um, Arsenal definitely enjoyed their time down by the seaside. The, the team lineup I thought was really, really good because we're keeping a consistent team and it's not something we've done for a very long time. And the fact that we've got competition for places all over the pitch, for me, is really, really good because you need people to fight for their place. When someone knows that they're guaranteed a game every single week, I guess sometimes they play a little bit complacent and they feel that even if they play badly, they're still going to get in the next game. And I feel like these Arsenal boys think or know that if they don't play well, there is someone waiting in the wings to come and take their place, which I think is really, really good. Um, the game itself, just briefly overview, was the first half was fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Is there's, I feel like we should have scored and could have scored more. And obviously the two goals that we scored in the first half were just brilliant because we were under no pressure. And I feel like Bournemouth are definitely going to struggle this season because the first, if the first half goes by anything, they were just there to be rolled over. We were passing the ball around, spraying the ball around, people going on runs up and down the pitch, taking shots. You know, it was just, if you could ask for a perfect first half, I think that was as close to it as humanly possible. Um, Martin Odegaard getting two goals in the first half. You know, I think that's something that even he admits himself that he's got to improve on in his game, in scoring goals. And, you know, he's got two in one game, which is really, really good. Um, and I loved, I, I noticed there's a really good interplay between Thomas Partey and Granit Xhaka. I feel like they're understanding each other a little bit more now because Thomas Partey is not really interested in getting forward. He knows his job. He knows he is... a deep line playmaker, defensive midfielder, whatever you want to call it. But he knows his job is to stop attacks and pass the ball on. That's all he's interested in. I feel like his game has been more simplified, which I feel is brilliant for us because he can let all the other players go forward and play football, basically. If he knows he's the stopper, and I don't want to call him a stopper because I feel like that's unjustified to him because his game is more than that because his passing, I feel, is really good as well. Um, the defence, the partnership between Saliba and Gabriel, I think is really good now. And I think it, by every single game, it's growing more and more and more. When Tommy Yasu comes back in on his um, back to full fitness, I guess it gives Arteta a good headache on who he plays, whether it's Saliba, Gabriel or Ben White in the middle, which, again, I would rather have that problem than not having anyone to play there. Um, Saka doing the runs... Um, I still feel he's maybe just a little bit off this season, but in time that will come brilliantly. And I don't know what else to say about Gabriel Jesus that hasn't been said already. I think that man is literally the missing piece to our jigsaw. He's so good. And the assist for, um, or the, I guess the first layoff for the um, first goal just says everything you need to know about Gabriel Jesus. He's literally so good. And I'm so happy we've got him. Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest challenge we're going to have on this podcast this season is is to talk about other players, excluding Gabriel Jesus each week, and it's going to be quite a challenge. But we'll we'll do our best. Josh, you're you're a big fan of of Martin Odegaard. Um, he's he's a player who I, I think I think it's I think it'd be unfair to say he got stick in the first couple of games, but a few people sort of questioned, you know, is his output going to be there? Is he going to get enough goals? Um, you know, is, is he going to provide that threat that we need kind of in behind, if you will? And he he got the two goals. He's influential. I didn't think it was a, a massive, um, what's the word? Oh, how do I put this? I, I, I thought it was quite obvious when he went off. We actually lost a bit of our flow, which kind of, I mean, the game was won at that point. Mm. But it kind of just, just displays how important he is to this team. What's your kind of thoughts? Did you have any any doubts at all about his form or how he would settle into this side or, or did those goals just kind of reaffirm what you already knew? Uh, I would say I think his big issue is that kind of missing that selfishness that mm. we've seen him when he's had the opportunities to score even in the three games that we've seen uh, in the league there's been opportunities for him to have a shot on target and he's not taken it and to be honest when you see his second goal he takes it off Jesus's foot I think Martin Odegaard of even last week 
would have said, yeah, actually, I'm going to stand off. Jesus, you have it. But he saw the opportunity. And clearly, you can see that there is progression, not only here with the manager, but with players within the squad as well. They are developing. They're all young players, and we can see them moving through and improving. Um, I'm not sure I'd necessarily agree with Carl and what I see from Saka. Um, I think right now... Our left-hand side is so strong and so aggressive. It's not leaving Saka um, isolated, but I would say everybody knows he was our danger man. When you think about it, when you've done any research on Arsenal for last season, Saka was the man. You need to shut him down. That's where, that's how you stop Arsenal. Certainly was for the last 10 games of last season. And I think it's still the same tactic there that he's being double up top. Um, yeah, he's being doubled up. And so not necessarily being able to influence the game as much, but we're still seeing those second, third passes before a goal, before a chance, they're most likely coming from him or he's got some involvement in our build-up play. And the same goes for Odegaard, that we are so, we've got so many different strings to our bow right now. And I would say with what we've got with Odegaard, he is, he was my choice for who should have been captain because you can see what he's got there. And yeah, he doesn't necessarily in, and I would say in the very short snippets of maybe 30 seconds to two minutes of a 15 minute to 30 minute half time that we saw of all or nothing, he was very quiet. We don't know what he says on the training ground. We don't know what else he says in the dressing room. And to be honest, a lot of the people probably saying, oh, why is Odegaard our captain? Probably wouldn't have Xhaka as our captain either, who was the most vocal in those clips. Um, so yeah, I think there is a reason why he's our captain. You can see how important he is to us. And I think as soon as we got that game fundamentally won after, um, yeah, 20 minutes or so that we could see that maturity in our game just to kind of shut up shop. We still started creating, you know, we still kept, we were kind of like, you know, the school bully. I mean, we had our arm outstretched on the forehead of Bournemouth while they were swinging, doing windmills underneath us and not really putting too much um, to us. And when we needed to, we'd go and push forward and we'd pick a third goal just to just to roll them back and uh, put them back in their place. But I would say that Bournemouth will cause a few upsets, um, especially if you're managed by a former um, golden generation um, England midfielder, shall we say. Um, We'll roll around when Everton comes in, but yeah, he's he's earned his stripes according to his jacket. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I do agree with that. Fair play, tip of the hat to Kiefer Moore, by the way, who worked his nuts off for little or no reward all day. Fair play to him. I think when you talk about the the captaincy and the overall kind of leadership in the team, I think it's overlooked in the modern era that you you don't get captains like you used to. It's not about the John Terry's the dare I even say the Harry Maguire's <laughs> remember him people like that it's not about just barking orders and shouting at people and you know pointing in random directions two of the greatest leaders that I think this club's had in the modern era Patrick Vieira Gilberto Silva almost polar opposites in terms of personality but anyone that you talk to who knew Patrick Vieira behind the scenes will tell you he was actually quite a quiet you know, private person. He wasn't He wasn't all about that. I think it's just the fact that on the pitch, he led by example and was a bit more vocal. And Gilberto was very much a, you know, an Erdegaard without the without the sort of number 10-ness, if you will. He was, he quietly went about his business. He could mix it. You know, he could put a foot, he could put a foot in and, and make a challenge, no doubt about it. But he led by example. And that's what I feel like Erdegaard is doing. Just before we go on to our next subject, I'll just say hello to a couple of people because I'm nice like that. Um, we've got Pete Coulson in there, Paul Neal, um, Jace, Jace Schrader's in there. Hi, Jace. Hope you're well. Uh, some bloke called Danny. Uh, I, 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 I can't. I just can't. We'll just move on from that. Sai, uh, Loki, Yusuf Ali, uh, Josh Page was in there earlier on. Mo Fala, which always makes me chuckle when I see that name, and our own Nick Wilson, and I'm sure many others. Uh, Central Goat is a particular one. <laughs> it's a great name. But yeah, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, please do give us a little like and subscribe if you haven't already. Don't worry, we'll remind you at the end if you forget, but a cheeky thumbs up would be lovely. And if you do have any questions for us, if you can just pop 
the letter K before each question, just so we know it's a question, and we will do our best to star them for the end of the podcast. Carl, let me come back to you, and let's talk about the, the greatest nation on the planet for producing footballers, which we know is France, obviously. Don't at me. William Saliba. We we can talk about the goal. Sorry. Someone was someone was gonna do it, weren't they? Let's be honest. <laughs> we we could of course talk about the goal and I will I will let you wax lyrical about that, but I want to drill down a little bit into it into the performance and and also just a bit about how fast this guy has adapted. I mean, anybody who who had seen him as I have and quite a few people who follow French football have done, not just his Marseille season last year, which is a breakout season, but the fact that he he was a leader at St Etienne, that he's, he's been on the radar for a while. But to step up from Ligue 1 level and from Marseille level straight into the Premier League side, he's walked straight into the first team. He's he's fast becoming undroppable. And let's not forget, he has made a, a mistake in, in the last couple of games. But it's not just the goal, is it? It's the defending, it's the confidence, the poise, the leadership again. He just looks completely at home in this team. What's your overall view? And by all means, if you want to mention the goal, feel free. I think the biggest compliment I can give him is that he doesn't look like a fish out of water. You know, I think playing centre-back is genuinely one of the hardest positions because if a goal goes in, you kind of can't hide because the first thing you do is looking at the defence. So you're looking at the defence and the goalkeeper. And I think that the fact that he's coming to the squad and he looks like he's been there for years just says it all. Um, yeah, but, you know, we can't, for some reason, I have to give it some sort of negative, but the, the opposition that we played hasn't been, you know, brilliant. And I guess the real test will come when we play the likes of, you know, Man City's, Liverpool's, um, dare I say it, that other lot down the road. Um, but right now, you can only play what's in front of you. And what's in front of him, he's, you know, he's taking it in his stride. And I think that, is the biggest compliment I can give him. For, for me, he you're right, he's confident. And with all the stuff that's happened in the past, I feel like, I think, do you know what would be good? Um, and all or nothing for this season. I feel like this is our breakout season. But I feel like Arteta may have had a word of him and just said, you know what? Don't even worry about what happened. What happens in the past, it's done now. You're here to play football. All you've got to do is just come in, play your game and just... You know, just be who you are. And that's what he's doing. And I feel like, <clears throat> you know, you see him on a pitch and he never looks out of place. I, I said this before, I think maybe one or two podcasts ago, is that he's going to make a mistake. It's going to happen. Lo and behold, he scores in that goal against Leicester. But it's how you come back from those mistakes. You know, the team rallied around him. They didn't like... I feel like if it was Manchester United, you would have seen someone like Bruno Fernandes throw his arms up in the air and start stomping the ground. No one did that at Arsenal. Everyone was just like, shit, it is what it is. We carry on, we crack on, and we grab again. And we did. And we end up scoring another two goals. So, um, for me, you can't dwell on these mistakes. He's young. He's going to make mistakes like everyone. He's bounced back. And like you said, Chris, the, the goal was something of of uh, brilliance. I can't even find the words. When he... <laughs> it was really funny because he come from like a free kick on the other side. And... When the ball came in, it went over the other side to Xhaka. And I thought Xhaka may have that just going to hit it straight across the goal again. And I saw him sort of just pass his sleeve on the, on the end of the, on the side of the box. And when Saliba just swung his left foot, I think everyone at the same point, probably watching the game live, would have all shouted out. Because I did. I definitely shouted, oh my God. Because one, I couldn't believe the goal. And two, I couldn't believe it was William Saliba. And three, I couldn't believe it was his left foot. So... <laughs> Yeah, it was I mean, just... Kutsinchenko. <laughs> Sinchenko's celebration, I think, for me, was probably the best, almost the second best part of the goal because it was just brilliant because even he was like, what the fuck? <laughs> how did, one, how did you score that? Two, you, like, are you sure? So everything about the goal was just brilliant. And this is what I like now because Arsenal just seemed like a family. Everyone was running over to him and I feel like it's the new celebration when everyone slaps um, the goal scorer on their head, which is... Absolutely brilliant. And I feel like Saliba now feels like he's at home. And I do hope he does sign that new contract and sign it very, very soon. Because I'm sure if he doesn't sign it before the end of the season, uh, your 
favourite website, Chris, GGFN, will definitely be on, oh, Saliba's being touted for a League One return and Saliba's doing <laughs> this and Saliba's doing that. Like, I'm, I'm sure now they're pissed because they can't mention him about a League One uh, a League One return. So, yeah, I do hope he signs a new contract. And like I said, um, Arteta now can't drop him. So it's a case of if and when, you know, he's going to have to rest him at some point. Of course he hasn't. We've got Europa League um, Cup games coming up and we've also got League Cup games coming up. And I'm sure that's a time when, you know, you may see Rob Holding and A another in the middle because Saliba can't play every game. But for now, he just looks like he's, you know, been there for ages. And I hope he goes from strength to strength in this Arsenal um, team because I feel like, Chris, you've obviously seen him play much, much more. But I just feel like he can definitely go on to just be one of our greatest centre-backs. And I know this is three games in, and it's very stupid to say this, probably from the likes of, you know, I'm comparing him to the likes of Tony Adams, I'm comparing him to the likes of Colo Torre, Sol Campbell, those sort of people. And But if he carries on playing like he does, it's just going to go on from strength to strength. He yeah, could be up I there with the rest of our French great centre-backs in uh, Galas and Squalachi. <laughs> <That's a best laughs> I, no, I, I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna kick back a little bit here. Um a couple of people in the chat have mentioned it. I think Anders just said um uh, let me just find it. I can't find it. I will I will saying. scroll it. I will scroll it. There you Sorry. go. Yeah, that hasn't one. played against the top six side yet. Please can we temper the obvious excitement to realism? Um I disagree. I disagree, and I'll tell you why I disagree. We 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 as Arsenal fans, we're we're always we're always very quick to to jump down our own throats, which is a horrible thought and indeed vision but you know we, we can we not just enjoy it you know can we not just actually say we've got one of the most sought after center backs in european football because that's what he is there there is there's talk in france that he might oust rafael rafael Varane from the french squad for the world cup should have been so, anyway, anyway well agreed yeah <laughs> but but i mean you know we're not sitting here saying he will be the new Tony Adams. We're not sitting here saying he will be, you know, the world's most perfect centre back. You know, every centre back makes a mistake, and yeah, he could play Liverpool and get absolutely roasted, and and we could all think, oh god. But when you look at the profile of the player, you look at what he's had to deal with. He's a, he's a you know he's a player who, by all accounts, like you said there, Carl was was on the edge of Arsenal. You know, he could easily have, and indeed over the summer did intimate. I'm not actually sure I want to come back. I don't, I'm not sure I feel loved. And I think the manager deserves a lot of credit for for maybe taking a little bit of a humble approach and actually holding his hands up and going, yeah, I don't regret sending you on loan, but maybe I did slightly rope you in with the wrong crowd and thinking that you might be not quite a fit for me. And and maybe actually you are. Um, and and he's, he deserves a lot of credit for throwing Saliba in. And I know he had injuries and whatnot at the start of the season, but... He could very easily have started with with White and and Gabriel and move. He could have brought Cedric in at right back instead of instead of uh, um, Ben White. So I think think the manager deserves a lot of credit. And I just think at this point in time, we back our own player. He's got a fantastic song. Something I love about him as well is his personality is coming out the more the games or more the games tick by. You can see that he belongs already and he, he looks comfortable. And he's a player who. You know, he's got a very sort of like Gallic, French, almost Henri-esque shrug about him of, yeah, I'm not really going to show my emotions. I remember when he first signed, he was in the crowd at, I think it was at Watford, wasn't it? Mixing with the fans. There, there's a player in there who will, he will be a vocal uh, dressing room leader given time. I think he's just settling in. And when he scored that goal, I mean, he was trying so hard not to go over the top, not to smile too much. And he couldn't help himself. And And I just think that we should be, I think we should be celebrating him and not saying, oh, yeah, but let's hold back a little bit. No, let's enjoy it. And when he makes a mistake, as he did against Leicester, you back him to go again. And and as you said, Carl, we need to get that new contract sorted out because there'll be a lot bigger clubs than those in France that will be looking at him, uh, particularly a couple of teams in Spain and, and maybe a certain team in Germany. So, yeah, I, I think we, we enjoy it. And I'm also quite annoyed that Philippe Claire picked up on the comparison that I had about him being very reminiscent of a young Rio Ferdinand. So I can't use that anymore. Um, but Philippe, if you're listening, I know that you stole that off me. It's fine. We're cool. It's not a problem. Josh, let's can move I, on. I was going to say, can I just add one bit, um, just to balance yes. the scales? Uh, it was of a course. fluke. 
He didn't mean to put it in the top corner. Oh, no, I, I, I think... <laughs> it was an think absolute if, swinger of a hit. Let's put it It that 100% way. was. <laughs> but but you know what? Sometimes you've got to... I think when, oh, yeah. when you t- when you take a swing at 2-0 up in a game you've been utterly dominant in, that's the time to do it, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I think when you're doing that at 0-0 or 1-0 in a tight game, maybe not. This, maybe that's not the time. But everything was going for us that game. And the only thing we, we really missed was that Jesus goal standing because that would have been the perfect... Mm-hmm cap to a, a very very good day just mentioning jesus though after saying earlier on that we weren't going to go <laughs> we're going to talk about him every week Josh. i do i do want to just praise him a little bit um he for me he had he had a lot of upsides when he signed he is proving to be i think probably better than any of us really expected him to be in terms of the whole package the leadership he's part of this this captaincy mm-hmm. group his ability that as you as I think both you and Carl alluded to that first goal the strength his close close control his body shape the fact that he I think he used that comment didn't he where he said like I'm not a robot here he it looks like a good fit he looks like a player who's just going to enjoy himself I guess my question to you is 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 it is there a lot of pressure on his shoulders that he can handle do you feel like he can handle this pressure a bit of knowing that he is the man if he's not in that side we're all going to go oh i don't know like as much as we might like eddie and any other strikers i mean it, there's a lot of pressure on a player despite how good he started isn't there let's put it this way in terms of pressure there's going to be more pressure on gabriel jesus in the world cup than any arsenal fan base can put on any player in terms of pressure look how it ruined Neymar in the uh, Brazil World Cup that he will have the entire nations because they want a number nine they know Neymar's not that for them and that's what he's trying to get at the moment I think that's why we're seeing him so hungry he wants that Brazil number nine shirt for Qatar and he wants to lead them to glory and he will have the weight of an entire nation on him and this isn't just a any old nation it is Brazil and they're going to, yeah. He's. I think he can handle the pressure. Um, some may say, "Oh, he's you know he's left Man City and he's kind of given up on his career to go to Arsenal." But I think that just shows that he's happy to take that level of pressure. Um, and I think he's he's showing that it's giving him. He can thrive off it. He knows he's got to perform because there's so many things on the line for him. What I'd like to, um, what I'd like actually like to see is how he reacts after the World Cup. You know, he's hit what he needs to do. His current goal is, uh, is probably what Edu and Arteta said to him: is you're going to get the minutes, and if you've got the form, you're going to be leading Brazil as the number nine to the World Cup, and they are always going to go into any World Cup wanting to win it. So that's a big role and a big responsibility for anyone. It'll be interesting to see what happens on the other side of the World Cup, irrespective of what happens, and if he continues to maintain this kind of energy, this desire, this passion, and everything we've seen up until now, uh, including pre-season. Uh, that's my only caveat uh, on his current form. But otherwise, I'm going to say I'm sitting back and I'm enjoying it because he is exactly what we need right now. He is performing way above everything that we imagined. He's that kind of perfect hybrid of all the good of Lacazette with all the great of um, Abamyang, but with the dribbling ability of Awobi uh, or maybe Reese Nelson or probably Saka, actually. He's probably the closest actual player. But sorry, go on, Chris. I was just going to say, do you know who, who he reminds me of? Because I know a lot of people have... Have have gone a little bit early and gone. Oh, he, he does remind us of a young Henri cutting in, etc. Um, mm. That's a bit a bit too fast for me. But what he does remind me of, and especially in this type of side, do you remember when we got Eduardo? Yeah, Eduardo is close to it. I don't always remember Eduardo being a dribbler. No, and true. He's got that that's on him. that's the thing, and then that's the same with Ian Wright as well. Is Ian Wright was great with his close control, but it was a different kind of game. You weren't as closely marked um mm. i would say and pitches are different and the speed of the game was different but yeah he is that kind of he is a different player for us he has mm. got everything yeah he's got 
almost every bit of every great striker we've had. Name one of their great attributes, and he's got it. Mm. Yeah, good in, good in the really air as well, there. which we haven't had for a while. A no, player no, can, can go to the near post and, and take chances. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like you, I, I agree. I think he, he's tr- he's a transformative signing. That's the that's the word to use. I think transformative. It just slightly concerns me about what happens if. Uh, that's my only concern, and um, we um, <clears throat> excuse me, may touch on that in a second when we talk about the the strength of the squad. But uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on with regards to the Bournemouth game, uh, I think you mentioned it from the off, Carl. But you've you've been to a lot of games, um, you know, mostly uh, albeit sort of the home home games. You're aware of what the atmosphere is like. But I know we we've already done the Saliba song, and uh, you know we we've had a chuckle at that. And, and you said the atmosphere is great. Those away fans, I mean, they were fantastic, weren't they? I know we're always going to see our fans as as, as the best because we're Arsenal fans, of course we're going to. But they really were brilliant, weren't they? And, and it, to me, like some of the players who went over to the, the away support at the end of the ground, there's a real bond, isn't there, between this squad and, dare I say, we've got quite a likeable squad. When, when even Granite's getting a song, you know things are going well. I guess my question to you would be, having been there, last season and indeed through the COVID times, do you have a slight concern that when the hiccup comes, which it will, is it a case of, fine, we could ride one iffy result, but if we go two or three games and and we're not playing as well as we are and the sun isn't out and the songs are not quite as as happy, do you have some concern that there are still some fans out there um, that might possibly have Nissans? That are, that are looking for us to fail or that are looking for something to, to call us out on and that could create a bit of a toxicity again. Chris, have you ever been on Twitter? <laughs> Chris, no, we, I avoid it. <laughs> we, we, we're top of the league and there's still people moaning about yeah, shit. In there as much. Do you know what it is? Last season, Chris, remember when we lost to Crystal Palace and the fans, the Wave fans, did not stop singing? Mm. Like, I was at that 3-0 game at uh, Crystal Palace and I was sitting in the Crystal Palace end um, and the away fans did not stop singing. We were three 0 down, and they were kept kept on singing. And I feel like, you know, I mean, that was the beginning of our little free season blip, wasn't it? Um, but I feel like there is a feel good factor within Arsenal, and inevitably we are going to lose again. You know, um, I wish we could go unbeaten in this season, but you know, if we're going to be realistic, it's not going to happen again. It'd be lovely if it did, but. I feel like now there's more of a positivity around the team, especially with the away fans as well. Like if we do go away to a another team and we do end up losing, I don't feel like they're going to get on the back because it just shows how much we've changed. Because do you remember when we lost to Crystal Palace a few seasons ago and they were sing, singing to better ring, you're not fit to wear the shirt. I mean, mm. I can't see something like that ever happening again, not unless we lose like 9 nil to that lot up the road, which will never happen. But um, I feel like the fans now, they're, you know, like I said, on, at Bournemouth, it was a perfect day. It was, like I said, the sun was out. Everyone was in a good mood, happy. They, you know, when you go away, have a fire kick kickoff, you, you already know that they spent half the day in the pub, you know, getting tanked up. So brilliant stuff, absolutely brilliant. And I feel like, even if we end up going away to flipping, I don't know, Newcastle or somewhere, I'm, I'm saying that because they're on the TV now, losing 1-0, I might have to try me. <laughs> um, oil can't buy, oil money doesn't always guarantee you games, does it? Anyway, um, I feel like if we do go away to that, someone like Newcastle and we lose, the away fans will still sing because they know that this is just a temporary blip and they know that we will bounce back because we have a better team now and we have a team fit for challenging for that top four um but again our fans like every other fan within the football sphere is going to moan about something they're always going to find something to moan about so i just take it with a pinch of salt and those fans are just literally there for attention because if you're if we're top of the league and we won three games out of three only conceded two goals and people are still moaning what you're never going to be happy like what is what is going to make you happy. What about Arsenal can make you happy? There's no team in the Premier League that has a 100% record apart from Arsenal. Like, no team. And you're still moaning. And the people who are challenging 
who, who are meant to be favourites for the title, Man City and Liverpool, they're way down in 14th and wherever Man City are, I can't remember where they are. So, you know, you've got to be happy. There is a buffer now between us and Manchester United and Liverpool and Man City. So, you, you have to be happy about something. You can't just keep moaning. So, for me, like I'm going on um, Saturday and I really want that to just to be like a positive atmosphere, singing. And well, I know we'll talk about it later, but Fulham are going to be no pushovers. They're not. They're gonna. It's going to be a hard game. But you know what? I want us to go out there, play positively. And I feel like the fact that we will constantly sing, constantly chant people's names, you know, that gives the team. You know, there's you know there's such thing about the twelfth man. It's. I really believe that because. If you go out there and you misplace a pass and everyone's going boo or moaning and hissing, that gets on players' backs. If you go out there and the, your fans are singing your name and they're clapping you and they're clapping a pass, you know, you're going to feel positive. You're going to play a bit better. So that's just my opinion anyway. Yeah. And you and you'll essentially get to see me on Saturday. I mean, what, what more could you want from a Saturday game? I mean, are you going, Chris? Yeah, I'm going this weekend. Oh, yeah. We'll talk later then. Yeah, me, me and me and the Welsh wonder. So um and, and for anybody who, who who is not watching this particular podcast and is only listening, this joke will be lost on you, unfortunately. But um, our thoughts and our prayers go out to this gentleman. Um, I'm sure we all remember him. Hope he's doing well. God bless. Maybe he's locked in that car, potentially. Maybe. Anyway, Josh, uh, coming on to, I guess, kind of a similar subject, but we are in the midst of still in the midst of this transfer window there's been a little bit of development in the last well the last day really in terms of uh, an out and potentially an in which we would be uh, remiss if we didn't cover and nicola pepe is off to nice um it's all but done he's having his medical tomorrow interesting the information i got last week was there was going to be a uh, buy clause with 22 mil arsenal have push back on that and so they don't want a buying clause on it which suggests to me main reason for that was because they they wanted or they want to see if he if he tears it up in in Liga maybe the valuation will go up a touch but with one year left I think they're I think they're pushing it to be fair but we shall see and I I do think he'll he'll do well in in Nice I think it's the move that we all we all sort of thought would happen and probably is needed and there's there's further rumblings about Yuri Tielemans this evening. A couple of fairly well placed journalists have have uh, come out this evening and, and said that the, the deal is still very much there and bubbling away. And Arsenal are just trying to get the fee down. What's your take on both deals? And are you still are you still thinking? Because we've had a few people ask us about Neto as well and this elusive wide player. Do you feel like the Pepe going out opens the door to that? And do you still feel like there's room for a Tielemans? Because I still think we need a striker. So where where's your thoughts on where we are at the moment? Yeah, I think there's certainly room for another wide player. Um, I would say irrespective of Pepe, if we're able to shift Pepe or not, he's clearly not what we need um, without saying anything about his ability or what he has delivered. He's just not what we need. Uh, and it'll be a good signing for Nice. Uh, he gets to link up with Aaron Ramsey again. Uh, I'm sure he'll enjoy that. Um, then s- otherwise, I think, yeah, there's been maybe a bit of a smart move taking out that 22 million buy clause. Uh, we've seen um, uproar, we would say, from the uh, accountant side of Arsenal Twitter. Um, not Swiss Ramble, but everybody else who uh, dabbles in it uh, with Mavropanos and Gwendouzi. You know, Gwendouzi, who was apparently a £50 million player one week and a £2 million player the other week, uh, depending on his performances um, or if he'd fallen out with the, the manager uh, that week. Uh, yeah, that we potentially let them go a little bit too cheaply. I think Mavropanos was £3 million, uh, £8 million, was it for Gwendouzi? That Marseille 10, paid in the end 10. 10 if it all if it all kicks together yeah appearances yeah. and everything so it's again a fee that you, people would argue one way or the other we should have done better again Mavropanos there was talks of her uh, you know Stuttgart just eventually just flipping him straight away out to uh, West Ham for 40 million and uh, <laughs> everybody t- tore their hair out but so I think that's one of the smart things you've seen that there is potential value in here we don't know um 
what this season will look for clubs on the continent, as you can, people are rightly noting is that the Super League does exist. It is currently going out and spending 70 million euros on Alexander Isak or uh, 40 million on uh, Lucas Paqueta. Um, there is money out there. It's just only in the Premier League right now. And what we're going to hope for, I assume, is that some of that money is going to go into the coffers of these um, European sides and they're going to start spending it as well um, and stop buying some of our players from us. Um, you could see with uh, Bayern immediately spent the money they got for Lewandowski on, uh, was it Delict they picked up from Juve? Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, you can see that the money is slowly getting back into these European sides um, and maybe it's safe to say if he has another... Um, Another season like he did at Lille, which made us pay, well, not made us, but encouraged us to spend £72 million on him, then we could rightly ask for more than 22 um, potentially. I'm so, not sure we can. With yeah. a year left, I'm not sure we can, but I, I get the point, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll see what can happen at that point. Um, and then as for... Yuri Tielemans coming in, I think it was always the case. You could see that he own if we were fully committed that he only wanted to be uh, going to Arsenal, which there were rumblings about him wanting to go to United, rumblings about going to Spurs. Neither of those have come to fruition. Um, so it's clear that he's only really got his heart set on probably one club. And we know how much in disarray Leicester are. I hmm. mean, they haven't replaced Schmeichel. They've called their second goalkeeper to their first choice shows you what kind of problems they're in right now financially um maybe not depending on how much money uh chelsea throw at them for fafana yeah, 85 apparently is what they're gonna pay. yeah hmm. i think there's it's still a case of we can just sit and we can do this on the 31st of january sorry mm. january august we can just yeah, sit do there it. and do this <laughs> but to be honest i wouldn't be against it even turning the screw even more, looking at where we're at right now and how actually short this season, the first half of the season is, just go and find, we'll come for you in January then. Mm. And we'll pick Tielemans up in January after he's probably ruined the dressing room in Leicester because he doesn't want to be there. Doing just about enough to get into the Belgian side, which I think he'd probably get into anyway uh, for the World Cup squad, even if he wasn't playing regularly. Um and yeah, I think this is where we're kind of seeing that smart recruitment. Some of us would have blinked already and gone, oh yeah, fuck it, 40 million. Uh, and then we would have got him. But if we can get him for 15, 20, maybe this is what they're kind of asking for. Wouldn't you just sit back, bearing in mind how we're playing right now? I, I think I think I would. The, the only thing I can't quite get my head around is that we, we've we clearly, I think a few supporters have, have said, I know, I know it's crossed my mind, Jack is arguably playing the best football of his career, certainly with us at the moment. Mm. Whether you, you know, whether you like him or you don't, whether you respect him or you don't, whatever, that's that's by the by. He's, he's clearly playing very well right now. So I was about to say the same. If if anything happens to either of those, or indeed you just choose that you want to rest them, I think my mm. only concern right what right now would be that you're you're then only looking at El Nene and 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 Sambi. Now that that's not a problem because we kept El Nene for a reason. You know, we didn't just keep him to be cheeky chappy behind the scenes he's obviously going to play some minutes but i do feel like if you if you can bring in a, a telemans for one of those two now it would probably make sense to do it now if the deal is on the table i do agree with you that 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 leicester are clearly playing hardball to try and get the money up mm. but my slight concern with them is if they get 85 for fafana they could well turn around to us and say well we don't we don't actually need the money now we'll keep the player so I do feel like if we want to get the deal done, I mean, obviously there's stuff going on behind in the background. Mm. That somebody said to me, a chap I know who's a Leicester fan, said that they're trying to get Ainsley Maitland-Niles as part of the deal. That would mm. make sense because mm. they would bolster their squad, and it's a player we clearly have no intention of playing anywhere. So that would make sense. But it, I don't know. I, I just we haven't been linked with any other central midfielders, have we? That that's the bit I can't. That's where I do agree with you. I feel like that deal is must be on the table because mm. we're being linked with wingers and, and potentially strikers. I think Arteta used the term firepower, didn't he, after the Bournemouth yeah. game? Yeah, I'd add which... a 
I'd probably add a third name into um, the backups to Partey, especially because we've spoken about El Nenny being there. I'd say there's someone in the current squad and currently in the starting eleven who, especially if Tommy Asu comes back, is prime at playing in that position. Thomas Partey, and that's Ben White. Ben White, yeah. As well. yeah, yeah he is that other option. Did it for Leeds. Mm. Uh, started the only season at Brighton that he played uh, a full season at. Uh, in that position next to Basuma at the time. So mm. again, has got that experience. And you can see with what we're kind of doing right now and the way we're inverting those fullbacks, he's sitting next to Thomas Partey already. Mm. So there's not True. a huge leap away to say that he could be sitting there and Tommy Arsu's to his right. Or uh, Zinchenko, for that matter. Yeah, and the same for Zinchenko. I think I see Zinchenko and Xhaka. That's quite interchangeable as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, my wonder is actually on kind of left back is there someone for the future we could pick up who is closer to Zinchenko than Tierney is um, because I think we've got Tavares who I assume come back and take up that kind of um, should we say Trent Alexander-Arnold school of uh, defensive fullback <laughs> uh, role yeah. that we've got um yeah so i think that's where we've got those options i think we've got plenty that we can mix around in that kind of back uh six or so mm. but it is wingers and fundamentally we had an issue last season that i think we would have got top four if we scored more goals i don't think it was yeah. too much of an issue in terms of yeah it was annoying that we lost because of some scrappy goals defensively but if you've got the fire firepower up top it doesn't matter Mm. There's a lot of those games you can just get through. Um, just ask, by just having ask a PSG good... about that. Just outscore yeah. your opposition and all, all attack, no no defense vibes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and just keep throwing on creative players, and you can see that's what we've gone after. Is we've brought in loads of creativity, and we just need, I think, someone else with that killer instinct. Mm. Um, whether yeah. or not that's Pedro Neto. That's an interesting one for me. Um, I, feel, I feel like that's an exciting one, but I, yeah. it reminds me of Diego Jota's move to Liverpool. That's what it reminds me of, mm. of that opportunistic signing of a player that you know is going to be very, very good and may not, you know, may not get first team start straight away this season, but within a few months will be playing his way into the first team. Um, the money for that though seems seems quite high, but then he is a George Mendes client, so Edu, etc. Just on the subject of transfers, actually, just before we do move on, just just a brief one, Carl. Do you have any concerns about the role that Emil Smith Rowe is going to play in this this squad at the moment? Because you know he's not getting in at the moment purely because the, the team are what it is. You know you wouldn't change a winning team, etc. Although we may touch on that with the Fulham bit in a second. But do you have any concerns about his role moving forwards in that he's starting to become that guy who can play three or four different positions, but isn't potentially going to be first choice in any of them? Um, no, because going forward, I just think we've got a lot more games to play this season. Will he get in? In will he get in in the league games? Probably not. He won't be a starter. Will he be a starter for Europa League games? Hundred percent. Will he be a starter for League Cup games and FA Cup games? One hundred percent. So it's not like he's going to get games. Not sorry, not going to get games. He's going to come on a sub for almost probably every game because it's just now five subs and he's guaranteed at least six games um, in the Europa League. So, no, not really. I'm not worried because, like I said, last season, maybe because we had no European football. So, you know, like I said, we was playing one game a week. But I feel like this season, there's an opportunity for people who want games to go out there and get it because I'm hoping that, you know, Arteta's not going to play the first eleven against FC whoever we, we get um, we play, um, you know that's the time to rest Gabriel Jesus, rest Saliba, rest Granite Xhaka, Thomas Partey, those sort of players, and you know Manchester. the likes. Oh yeah, the likes of Lukonga can come in. The likes of El Nene maybe can play. Um, the likes of Vieira, Eddie and Ketia, you know those people will come in and they get games, and I'm sure smarter men than you and I. You know, Arteta probably said to these people, you're going to get games, just wait. Just mm -hmm. hold on to the Europa League starts and League Cup starts. And, you know, you'll be playing games. 
you will come off the bench and make a difference. We are now allowed five subs, not just yeah, three. So I don't have to. I don't have to be so careful with my substitutions. You know, I can throw you on in the 60th minute and still have four subs left. You know, to mix it up. So at mm. the moment we're playing well, but there's going to be a time where we're going to need to change the game. You know, at the moment we're playing well, we don't need to. We've dictated the game. If there's a time when we're two nil down or one nil down and we need more firepower, we need more attacking players, then yeah, you know, Emil Smith Road may get a, be thrown on, Eddie Nketiah may be thrown on, Vieira may be thrown on, all these players. So um, at the moment, I'm not really worried about, you know, players knocking on Arteta's door or talking about game time. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair point. Yeah, and uh, and and Emil's got to stay fit first and foremost, doesn't he? That's that's the key thing for him. He's got to develop that. Uh, he's got to, he's all, It feels like he's growing into his body at the moment, and he needs to keep that that Saka level of fitness to be considered a, a sort of a regular first team starter, I guess, at, at this particular point in time. Before we have a look at, we'll have a, a brief, just a brief chat about Fulham in a second, and and uh, and take some questions before we wrap up. I do just want to do. Our, uh, our kind of our new thing, which is our little little glance around the Premier League at just any particular stories. Uh, just the probably the highlight of the the weekend's games um, was the Monday night game where Man United turned into uh, peak 19, 1970s Brazil and decided to actually turn up, which was lovely of them. Um, did you see the video of Trent trying to defend? That was quite amusing, hmm. wasn't it? Um, <laughs> we need to narrow down which game that is, to be honest. Um, well, yeah, that is true. Yeah. Particularly uh, this, I'd, this I'd game. Like to, uh, I'd like to just continue to raise my flag that says that this is the reason why Trent doesn't get into the England side at mm. right back, uh, is purely because he cannot defend for Toffee um, yeah. or, for, or for Liverpool on that matter. <laughs> or for um, anyone. Yeah, uh, the sooner they, um, the sooner that they put him into midfield. To be honest, I think is probably the best for his career. Mm. Um, Which is mad that they haven't done it already. Mm. No. Yeah, especially it, with the limited options they've got right now. Uh, yeah, you, you put James Milner there, play him at right <laughs> back, and uh, put Trent into midfield. But you know what, Klopp is—he's stubborn, um, and he's getting to that. Was it seven years? The um, yeah, the seven-year cycle. Got seven mm. years at uh, Dortmund and seven years just coming around at Liverpool, and I, I had a feeling there was um, there was something about the wheels potentially falling off with this Liverpool side. Um, I thought it was actually going to be last season. Shows how much I know with them winning that quadruple. Mm. Um, sorry, um, getting to a final in every competition, um, not winning a quadruple, but yeah. Um, I think Formula Noza, uh, if you've seen the uh, if you've seen the tweet as well, there's a little tongue and cheek um, thing as well. Carl, how long does your inhaler last? Seven years. Yeah, it's about actually. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? I've got it right here. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah it's, it's about seven years. I must say, about just... seven years before you. Yeah, you're in. If you've got asthma, it just runs out. You can't. You can't I, find find, that I find it funny that with Liverpool, just quickly on them, um, that. People were saying that Salah was the, um, the the glue that kept us together, and I always said it was Mane. Oh, Mane yeah, for me is a better player than Salah. Yeah, Salah gets all the highlights because he scores the spectacular goals, and um, you know he, he seems to be the focal part of the team. But Mane was the literal workhorse. He was the one that would hunt balls down and you know get balls back, and he would the one that passed because Salah didn't really pass, and Mane was the one. His assist was quite good, and I feel like. The fact that they've lost him, and don't get it wrong, Diaz is an absolutely brilliant player. He is. He's, he's not shit, let's be honest with you. Um, but I feel like Salah was the... Sorry, Mane was the one that kept that Liverpool team ticking. And now they've gone. And obviously they thought, OK, we've lost Mane and we can replace him with Diaz. And yeah, Diaz is a very good player, but he's no Mane. And mm. I feel like that, that midfield as well, Liverpool is... Um, he's aging, you know. You've got a 36 year old James Milner starting games against Man United away, seriously, mm. like really. And Van Dijk, um, yeah, I'm not gonna say he's a shit defender, he's not, but the fact that that first Man United goal, the fact that he just stood, if that could you imagine if that was an Arsenal defender, yeah. we would be going ape shit. If that was Mustafi, and let's mm. not let's, let's be honest with you, he's probably done that in the past. <laughs> um, 
we would be going ape shit, absolutely ape shit. Like for me, that's that's unforgivable. How do you have a man in the box and you stand there with your arms behind your back and not go to engage him? Mm. That's, 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 his, that's his knee injury. That's it's, his knee it's, injury. His form's gone off a cliff, though, hasn't it? Not just in terms of how he reads the game, but I just feel like he he just that's doesn't it. have that presence at the moment. I don't know what it he is. Lost it's a that, um, I think it's. I treated that ACL after mm. uh, you know, that Pickford tackle. He's Love just lost half a yard. Half a yard's mm. gone from his game, mm. and that's enough for a top level. For especially with how little cover he has, yeah, yeah we that's say. true. And Joe he Gomez as well. Get, he has to get it right every time. Um, mm. Yeah, and yeah. he's just lost that. He's lost that half yard that they needed to play such an aggressive high line. Um, but they've got Canate. Um, yeah, who yeah, is another great who is French centre back? Yeah, I mean, he he is decent. I think I think he's probably the pick of the bunch. When I mean when Van Dyke's fit, obviously he's still one of the best mm. defenders of the world. Clearly, but mm. were, were, were we were impressed with United? I mean, I don't I don't really. That, they feel like it's a side that could do that last night, and then they'll probably go and lose to Southampton at the weekend. You just can't really. I mean, they're bidding what a hundred million for Anthony, who's a. You know, that is he, crazy. He, he, yeah, all right, but he's a 20 million, 25 max for me type of player. He's done nothing that makes me go, Yeah, he's worth that. I mean, I, I mean, we say that and we paid 72 million pounds for Pepe. Well, yeah, but, yeah, uh, true. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair point. It's but, a 20 million but, winger, but at least Pepe uh, had, a, had a you know, a standout yeah. full season in, in Liga. I mean, Anthony's been yeah. decent but the for thing about is six Ajax I'll just be looking at thinking, okay, if you want to sign all your ex-players, that's fine, mm. but you're going to play top dollar for them. Mm. Like, it's just, I don't know if it's just funds in football or Ajax are just seeing Man United and Ten Hag and think, you know what, we're going to milk you for everything mm. you've absolutely got. Mm. And they can hold out and, you know, they bidded 50, they rejected it, 60, rejected it. The fact that it's gone up to the last figures, like, up. yeah, I think the last figures I saw was 80 million with mm. like 70 odd up front. Like what? Yeah. And then Man United yeah. fans have got the cheek to still want Glazers out. Yeah, They're spending they money, so what the or, fuck? Like, what do you want? Or, him to, what, what do you or want them to do? as the as the 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 tea or the Oh yeah, they couldn't the smell. But yeah, get, that, get out. a bit of a joke. It's a fact that <laughs> you know you want Glazers out, but what you've asked for, you they've given to you. Yeah. In, I'm sorry, I know Casemiro is a very good defensive midfielder. He is but 60 million. He's gone for the money, hasn't he? Let's be honest. He's oh, of course, he has. Like, it's and you can't blame him at that age. Yeah. 400 pounds a week, you're flipping yeah. wood. But, um... I mean, they they are literally a an Arteta, Mertesacker, Ben Ayun trolley dash away from being peak 8 2 <laughs> Arsenal, aren't they? I mean, that they, they are. That all they need to do now is, is just buy another three sort of Harry Maguire, Luke Shaw's, and they are peak. I mean, it, uh, I don't know. I, the only thing that concerns me about them slightly is that. An inform and, a, and a, a fit and confident Rashford is makes them a different team. That that mobility aspect up front, same with Martial, who people have forgotten is still, you know, he's still a very good player. Let's be honest. I don't think he was ever quite what what he was hoped to be, but he's still very good. And if they can shift the uh, the poisonous Portuguese out out the back door, that that for me is the key. If they get rid of him, that they can push on. If he stays, that dressing room will be toxic for the rest of the season. There's just no doubt about it to me. Um, speaking of toxic, Josh, have you ever have you ever used the have you ever spoken to work and said, look, the truth is the way I travel to work is what affects my performance because that's what Tuchel did um, <laughs> when he when they went to Leeds and and Edward Mendy had a brain fart and it all went a bit horribly wrong. I mean, I'm no Leeds fan, but it's quite funny to see Chelsea implode, isn't it? It is quite funny. Um, so I'm going to see Leeds up close and personal next weekend whilst you're at the. Uh... I'm sure at the game this weekend I will be mm. I'll be at the Amex watching Leeds. Um that's gonna be interesting because they've got a uh, Carl, you know what picture you've got when you do that, by the <laughs> Every way. Every time it's just like oh. I don't know, I think it's Danny. Danny, I think it's yeah, it is. as ABW. It, it is it is Danny in a very good <laughs> I obviously uh, I didn't put that picture. <sighs> yeah, you did. It's from your personal collection. <laughs> it's, like, exactly, it's ever, no. it's ever decreasing real. sponges. That's uh, <laughs> the series. Um, yeah, I think to be fair, yeah, that Chelsea look an absolute mess. Um, and just, I think any team that looks energized will just, yeah. Um, who was, it was a French journalist that was just 
perplexed that Mendy won um, goalkeeper of the year. Me too. Like, uh, don't get me wrong, his his story is great. And he, he literally, he, I think he only turned pro at like 24 and he came from the lower leagues. And, and yeah, when he was mm. at, when he was playing in France, at Rennes, he was a brilliant keeper. But I just don't see what everybody else has seen. Like, he's a very good shot stopper, but yeah, I think he, he can be very erratic. And that, I think that goal's been yeah. coming for a the, while now. The fact that they want Harry Maguire from a, oh, oh, God. there's talk please. of them wanting Harry Maguire. Yeah. Exactly. Like that. That's what I'm saying. Please, yeah. please let that happen. Like, I mean, even, because... even Koulibaly, I mean, don't get me wrong, on his day, still a very good centre-back sent off this weekend. They, mm. They've signed him three years probably too late. He's not at his peak now. Is he 31 now? I mean... Yeah. And Thiago Silva, that's that's uh, that's pushing yeah. it age wise. But that's it? another trolley dash, isn't it? Like it seems like for the first time, I feel like Arsenal have got shit right, mm. and everybody else around them is everybody else around Arsenal thinking shit. We mm. now need to uh, listen. I don't feel Arsenal are title contenders. I, I, re- I honestly don't. But I feel like now people are looking at Arsenal mm. thinking shit. They've got they've got their process right they bought young players there's their defense is sorted their midfield is sorted they've got gabriel jesus now we now need to sort of have a some sort of plan and chelsea's plan is non-existent like i, I don't get what chelsea's plan is they still haven't got a striker and they still continue with with habits up front and i don't understand how people are not on habits back because he does not score goals like, no. at all. He's an attacking um, midfielder, isn't he? He's not a forward. Of course he is. I mean, yeah, yeah right. they've they got rid of everybody else in that kind of, uh, you know, Lukaku, Werner, Ziyech still there? Yeah. He's still there at the moment. Still there, Alfa, but they kind of want to, they want to get rid of him, don't they? Mm. But yeah, but I feel like if Anthony of, goes, if Anthony yeah. goes to Man United, he'll go to Ajax. He'll right. go back to Ajax, yeah. 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 And then it just seems so weird that the only reason that Havertz isn't getting that shit is because one, he's significantly younger than the rest of them. What is he? Still only twenty, and the fact that's, he scored a goal for them in the Champions League final. Yeah, yeah, he's living. He's dying. That's it. He scored the mm. winning goal in a Champions League final for them. That's it. it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to do anything else. Can continue on his Torres-like career. But the downside is, we all know that Aubameyang will be popping up there shortly, and, and inevitably, you know, See, I don't think home. he will. I don't think I... he will. But Barcelona have to sell, don't they? And and they the first... have to sell one of him or Depay, don't well, they? Well, no, apparently no, this is this is the thing. See, I was just mm. gonna say, um, twenty three by the way, have a bit older than we thought, but uh, apparently they have to shift too. In order to, to register uh Jules Kunde, who by mm. the way could walk away for free within the next week if they don't get his contract sorted please, out and register please, him, please which is hilarious. Um they, they have to shift both. So Depay is halfway to Juventus, although it's talk that fun enough Man United are now interested. And and Aubameyang is 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 the next cab off the block. So mm. it, it is honestly like, you know, if you just put clown masks on these clubs, it's just like who can we buy? It's just it's like jumble sale shit, isn't it? I I can't really get my head around it. I've just um, seen I've just literally seen uh, uh, I think from Mr. Boblex in the comments, and he just said, "I'm and I'm quite shocked that no one's coming for him." Rob Holding, yeah, like, I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm actually really shocked that someone like a Chelsea hasn't said, "Okay, so they've mm. now got Ben White, they've now got Saliba, they've now got Gabriel. Mm. Let's just see if they would sell Rob Holding." And well, he's, you know, I'm, I'm he's, actually quite shocked that no one's coming for him. He's got Villa written all over him now. Diego Carlos is banjaxed. They can reunite him in Callum Chambers, can't they? That, yeah, that, they that. just um they let um oh, who's the centre back? Uh they got Konza and someone else, something that's also with a K, and one of them's just oh no, maybe it was Wedley House. He's gone oh, out. Oh house here, yeah, Courtney House. Courtney House, house, yeah, yeah. Yeah. house has gone out on loan. So they're bringing uh, so someone in, aren't they? Yeah, they'll bring someone in. I don't think it'd be Rob Holding though. I think mm. we named him as one of the guys in the leadership team. You can see how he helped with Turner settling. And to be honest, I don't think he's he's happy to kind of sit and play his role. He knows he's going to get Europa League games. True. He enjoys working with Arteta. Obviously, loves living in London. Mm. And I think, to be honest, uh, where's his girlfriend playing at the moment? Is she still with Braga? I could not tell you, if I'm honest. I think his missus was at Braga last season. Um, 
I mean, I'd yeah. keep him, but I just, I, I just wonder just, when he's yeah. going to play. I thought Newcastle well. or somewhere like that might come in for Everton. him, but mm. uh, but again, you're sitting there. We're not, we're not trying to get rid of him. We're not actively trying to sell him. No. Would you? Sure. Why would he want to go? Yeah. Why would you want to leave to go to any of those teams? Yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a fair point. I guess it's the only. I guess the only reason why maybe he might want to go is to guaranteed first team football. I mean, Rob play, Holding yeah. would play at at, at Chelsea, hundred percent. He'd play at, um, mm. Aston Villa, hundred percent. He'd West play Ham. West Ham, Newcastle. He'd get mm. games, and you know, with players still, I mean, with Harry uh, Maguire out of form, mm. there's still a and Tyson Tyson hear me, Tyron Mings, shit. Mm. The, you know, the England centre backs are kind of there for the taking. I mean, yeah, you've true. got to be looking at um, Ben White and a another. I mean, you know, Harry Maguire at the moment cannot get into that Man United team and will not get into that Man United team. Um, mm. Tyra Mings, I'm sorry, how the hell he's an England international and he's not starting for Villa either. So no. you're now thinking, hmm, okay. Well, we've, we've- You've got you've got Eric Dyer to come in, of course. So that's key going into the World Cup. Um, Jesus Christ! Yeah, <laughs> I, I think to be honest, even as much as I love Rob Holding, there's two centre back, two English centre backs at Brighton that I think deserve a call up before he does mm. to oh, the England sure. squad in Webster and Dunk. Um, Dunk in particular, yeah. yeah Dunk will never get an that. England call up. Yeah. Um, no. He just didn't go through the youth ranks. Um, that's the problem with him. Webster did. Um, and that's the one that I think have a look at, seeing what happened there, because I think Chelsea might try and sneak a bid for him. Yeah. Um, although I, I'd rather they didn't, because we've, we've, we've we've still already got, got to do a rescue mission for Kukurea at some point. We've still got seven days of the window to go. Uh, stay tuned to our Twitter feed, mm. by the way, if we do a transfer show, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, one quick question I'm just going to ask you both for a yes or no answer. Uh, Kieran Trippier, would you send him off, yes or no, Josh? Yes. Cool. Yes. Full house. Interesting. I've had a lot of people defending it. For me, nah. Doesn't matter if you're trying to hurt somebody or not. That's a dangerous tackle. End of story. No attempt to play the ball out there. You know exactly Precise. what he's doing. This exactly. whole nonsense of, you know, he wasn't trying to hurt them. Like, no player goes Doesn't out matter. trying to hurt no. him. But no. he still go out and do it. Like, yeah. one of those yeah. things. So, what he's Kevin trying to do is stop the player. And if Kevin De Bruyne does his play. knee ligaments and misses the rest of the season... Mm. You know, like the Van Dyke situation, like you know, that's his season over, isn't it? Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you guys. Um, and I like, uh, ugh, oh, I feel a bit dirty as an ex Spurs player, but I, I don't mind Trippier as a player. I think he's, he's a I like Trippier, kind of I think we were right in the league, but yeah, I agree. But, um, but it's, yeah. Like, it's like I think I tweeted, I can't remember which account I tweeted from the English tax works wonders. Mm. If the, well, and, and I hate I hate saying it, and you know what I'm going to say if it was if it was Shaka, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's yeah. face it, no, it was Shaka, and it part. was against Swansea. Yeah, yes. and also it and we it never saw it again. It was a Shaka tackle against Palace. That was not dissimilar either, was it? A yeah. sort of a, you know forwards tackle. So yeah, mm. yeah. No, I agree with you guys. Um, just quickly before we take the questions, I did say we'll give a quick nod to Fulham. Like I said, we'll do the preview show. I uh, believe Danny's going to do that on Friday. I want to say, I think it's Friday. Uh, so we'll we'll cover that in the preview show, but um, I will be going as I've uh, alluded to earlier on. So um, hopefully I'll be able to catch up with Carl and, and a couple of the gang up there. Uh, if you are going and you see me, please don't throw any abuse at me. I- I'm just human like you. You can come and say hello; it's fine. But no, in all seriousness, I'm looking forward to it. Momentum is is obviously key. That let's hope that we can we can get the win there. The only question I'm going to ask you both, um, and you can answer this in no more than a minute each. Uh, Carl, I'll start with you. Would you be tempted to make any changes at this point? And if so, why? And if not, why? Um, no. and I'm, Familiarity is brilliant with their football squad and the fact that they know each other at the moment. Um, Fulham don't have many many threats but they do have that one big threat and I feel mm. like the the threat is getting the ball into him and you know get it onto the side of onto his head um I feel like we've got enough to beat Fulham but the g- good thing about having a big squad or the squad that we have like we can change it if it's not working you know we can bring off Ben White bring on a Tommy Yasu or bring on um a Kieran Tierney 
uh, bolster the midfield, put Eddie up front, bring on uh, a another. So at the moment they're playing well, and I think there's nobody in the squad that deserves to be dropped. Mm. So I wouldn't want to see that happen. If we end up dropping points against Fulham, God forbid, then maybe look to change it up. But at the moment, no, I'll keep as is. Hmm. It bloody bl- it better bloody not do. It's costing me an arm and a freaking leg to get up there. Uh, Josh, um, Bert Leno's coming back. Be nice to see him. Mitrovic versus Saliba. That could be interesting. I, I have a suspicion they'll try and put Gabriel onto Mitrovic. But they've also got this this uh, defensive midfielder, Paulinho, as well, who who seems to... A lot goes through him. Hmm. Would you be tempted to make any changes? Would is there anything that you would look to freshen up or, or change tactically, or would you stick with what we've what we've got? Um, I probably wouldn't change anything. Looking at how the fixture list kind of lies, I would be looking at anyone that plays on Saturday is probably going to play the United game the weekend after. It's hmm. then a case of what do you do for Mi- Villa midweek uh, on the Wednesday. How do we look at rotating some players out for that? Um, it's a but... league game, it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would expect yeah. rotation for a midweek game, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd expect some rotation at that point. Um, and it's how we make sure that those players that are going to rotate in for Villa, how do we give them enough minutes, um, to make sure we're not going in cold because it could be and screams, you know, uh, Gerard on the ropes, um. Mm. Yeah, kind of <laughs> come back kind of thing. We know how that storyline's been written. Callum Chambers um, off his cock in the ninety-third minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, do, it does yeah. have a whiff of of yeah, because because Villa have looked really pretty rough, haven't they? This so far this season, they beat they Bolton four-one last night, and they were still shite. I mean, Fulham lost to Crawley two 0 last night. Um, yeah, true. And by the way, that be it. Ten changes it, in there tonight. <laughs> If you haven't, I, I I don't watch as much EFL as I probably should. I will confess um, that Bolton keeper, good lord, I've seen some bad keepers in my time. That guy was hideous. I think he's called Dixon. Something is it Joel Dixon? He was so bad, so oh, so it's bad. Not, um, it's not UC's son anymore. Uh, no, was, not, uh, well, it was the Yaskalainen. It could have been their rotation keeper, like the second choice or something, but he was so bad. I mean, he gave away a penalty, which was just moronic, and then he left his near post wide open and uh, didn't he? Just went, oh, yeah, mm. lovely. I'll pop that in there. And he was so bad. Anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, for the record, I'm with you guys. I think I'd keep it as it is for, for uh, assuming there are no injuries, of course. We'll get our, t- our testers update in the next 24 hours, I would imagine. But assuming there's no injuries or niggles, uh, I think I'd be tempted to keep it the same. At the very worst, maybe rotate one of the front three. But the way Martinelli's playing, you can't leave him out. Odegaard picks himself. And, and uh, you know, Saka hasn't found his, his best form yet, but this is the type of game that he could well have some joy in. So we shall see. Uh, so that is Saturday upcoming. As I say, we'll be doing the preview show for that one. We've got the Europa League draw, I believe, is tomorrow. So we will find out God knows where we're heading this year. But uh, that'll be something to... Friday. Oh, is it Friday? Friday. Sorry, Friday. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's Wednesday, isn't it? I think it's Thursday. Yeah, Friday. So basically, before the weekend, we'll know who our Europa League opponents are. And that competition comes around pretty quick. I think it's in like a fortnight's time we get underway with uh, God bless BT Sports uh, coverage of Thursday night football. Can't wait for that. Anywho, we shall um, round off the podcast this evening, as always, with a couple of questions. Uh, Carl, I will hand over to you. We will answer these all in a couple of minutes max between us. Okie dokie. Um, let's go on up to see because of ever the professional Carl will Grizz. Um, <laughs> Pete Colson says, um, I'm terrified that we will lose Saliba. Uh, how much damage was done of the mismanagement of him? I fear we have trained up a generational talent for a cash-rich team. Uh, Chris, what would you say to that? Mm. Is that a statement or a question? I, I, um, all I would say, Pete, is I would, I would imagine, and, and I'm fairly confident that we are already in his ear about a new contract. I think, I think it would have been rather silly of us to have gone in quite heavy with the contract offer in the summer before he started playing a game. Because if you're Saliba, you've had a brilliant season at Marseille, the French Young Player of the Year. Your stock is really high. You're 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 on the verge of greatness, um, but you're going back to a club who you have no idea if they have any intention to play you or not. So I think the nod of faith to him in the first team will probably change his mind. 
But equally, if he's a sensible young man, I'm sure his agent is, if they've got any sense, they'll probably say, yeah, things are going great right now. We're loving life. But let's just see where we are kind of Christmas time. We'll see where we go from there. The ball's in in his court right now, which is dangerous for us. But I I think there's enough there to suggest that we'll get this done. Um, but we do have another contract that we also need to worry about in the form of Saka as well. So I wouldn't be terrified, Pete, but I would be concerned if a Bayern Munich or a Real Madrid happened to come sniffing uh, and his form continues. But I wouldn't be terrified at this point. I understand. Uh, question for you, Josh, uh, from Procrastinating Womble, and he asks, um, do you think Martellini will be the next Jesus? Ooh. Um no I think he'll be different uh, and I think he might have a higher ceiling mm. I think he's got the point where he would be taking the starting role at a team like Manchester City I think that's where he's kind of going in his projections um, yeah he is special um, so yeah I would say no I think he could be even better and I agree with that. I think this is his season, Martinelli. I really do. Like everything I've seen about him, he's he looks bigger, he looks faster, he looks stronger. He's re- interviews really well. He's got his head screwed on, very family orientated. Just wants to do the best for his career. I think his I think his potential is limitless if if he stays injury free and keeps going. In fact, people talk about Saka. Uh, I might worry more about losing a Martinelli to a Man City than I do Saka personally. But we shall see. But yeah, I think he's he's been really good so far this season. Interesting. Um, Chris, this is questions for you specifically. Uh, it's from Hatumi. He says, question for Chris. What is happening with Marseille? Why is Tudor not starting Payet? <laughs> uh, well, Marseille are the classic um, dumpster fire team of France. They um, Nothing is ever straightforward at the Velodrome. They are... Uh, yeah, their fans are extremely passionate. They're not to be messed with. They do have a history, as England fans from the World Cup, and they don't suffer fools gladly. Igor Trudor's come in, having taken over from a, an equally uh, nuts coach in San Paoli, and all is not particularly well there. Bemba Dieng is another one who's trying to leave because he's not happy with his game time. Dimitri Payet is, is an immensely talented footballer, but he does have that Ronaldo element of him in that he's very divisive. He's a bit of a snake in the dressing room as West Ham fans. And yeah, he, he's he's been deemed by Tudor as, as not fit and sharp enough to start games right now. And it's hard to disagree because he has often had a few issues with the pies. Uh, not the pie, but literally the pies. Um, but yeah, and he's 30, I think he's 33 now, 33, 34. He's getting up there. Um, as for Marseille, though, yeah, this this season will go one of two ways. It will either end up in a massive bin fire or they will fluke their way into the Champions League and finish second behind PSG, who are already way out in front in, in, in the league. So, um, yeah, I, I don't exactly know what's going on there, but I will say that Igor Tudor has um, he's made a rod for his own back if it doesn't go well. We'll put it that way. Um Question for you, Josh from Demsec. He says, "Is there a place for a tall, for old tall star striker?" Yeah. Oh, it's going to go straight in with yes. But you know what I could see happening, and uh, some people might know where I'm going with this now. There is the go. old stick Gerard Piquet up at the uh, <laughs> up front when Barcelona are trying to find a goal in the 90th minute. And it could be one of Gabriel or Saliba. And to be honest, we are kind of playing with three centre-backs at the moment right now. And it could be more of a case of actually, if we do need to just put a head on a stick up top, then we know, well, Gabriel was the top scoring good offender last season uh, for centre-backs. Easily could be an option for us to go, all right, Gabriel, you go up there. Saliba and White hold four. Uh, whilst we push for the goal that we need. So I think it might be more of a, a roaming centre-back will uh, fulfil that role if we ever need uh, a few heads on the stick. Mm-hmm. Okay, I still think there's... I still want a tall star striker, and I think there is room for one. Whether they get game time, who knows? I feel like someone who... 
do you know who something like a mirror self closer you know someone who you know you're not going to get in the game time but we're going to throw you one at some point um who's happy just to be second string maybe even the third string Jovic would have ticked that box before he went to Fiorentina. We missed out on that one. I think um, Arkadius Milik, funnily enough, is another one who wasn't particularly happy mm. at Marseille. Is off to Juventus by the sounds of it. There are there are strikers out there. Just please don't make it Morata because I don't think I could deal with that. I think there's a lot of them though that of those big tall strikers that are still out there. A lot of them still think they're getting into their World Cup squads. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's not many out there of the requisite quality that we'd want that mm. aren't going into a World Cup year wanting to get into their World Cup squads. So we're not going to get them this side of um, January, to oh, be honest. I'm, I wouldn't have minded us sort of, you know... Uh, Calvert-Lewin was never a goer for me, but I wouldn't have minded us going for a Premier League ready centre forward. I just don't know who I, it would have been. Chris Wood is the only one that I can think <laughs> of that fits yeah. that mould and yeah. will be available once Isak's signed. Or whoever honest. they... Yeah. yeah, and apparently West Ham are after um, Lucas Paqueta now, which is also made yeah. me very upset this evening. But yeah, uh, I digress. Speaking of which, actually, Carl, I'm just going to jump in very quickly. Pete Coulson asked a second question I just noticed in the chat as well, and he mentioned about uh, Neto and Tielemans we've already covered, but he, he did mention the, um, the forbidden word, Husam Awa, <laughs> who's, um, who's apparently going to be going to Nottingham Forest. I was going to say, sure. yeah, he's going to Forest, isn't he? Yeah, but there is some Where late interest Forrest from. Where getting this fucking money from? Seriously, I'm, oh, down the back of the sofa. There, there is there is some interest coming in late from two other unnamed Premier League clubs, apparently. Uh, but yeah, it seems like Forest have, have got the jump on it. Um, one of them is rumored to be Everton, which would be interesting. But yeah, uh, unfortunately, how how it's fallen, and he's still only I think 25, 26. He's just That's uh, another money job, isn't it? And this is what happens when you have a really bad season. He had a really poor season last mm. year. I, I think arguably our chance to sign him was last summer if he didn't come in then. And he basically just spent the season sort of miserable at Leon and, and his form went off a cliff. So that's what happens, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And we ended up with Odegaard. So, uh, I mean, okay. exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I think we'd all rather yeah. where we fit in that, uh, sit in that. I can also line. answer avon's question as well if if you want which is a quick one um Go on. following balagan um he avon asked whether he's getting much coverage in france lots lots three and three games he's uh albeit one of them was a penalty uh the one he got at the weekend was a bit of a scrambled effort but he as i predicted uh is getting game time for rams and he is going to be he'll be their focal point some people are sort of saying he's a bit Jonathan David-esque in terms of what Lille bought, you know, a player from another league who just went straight to the side. Don't get me wrong, Rams are, are a very mid-table club in France. They're not gonna they're not gonna be potentially up there with the the biggest and best in, in Liga, but he will he's getting games. They really like him over there. The uh the the Rams fans are have really taken to him. He's a fan favourite already. He's replaced Hugo Ekatike, who was linked with Newcastle before he went to PSG. And um, yeah, he's 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 enjoying it. He's settled and he's having a good time. And I think that's the sort of loan that is absolutely perfect for him. He'll get goals. He'll get game time. He'll develop. He will play in, you know, in that role, sort of a loan striker role. So he'll have to learn that hold up play a little bit more, and, and he'll he'll fill out a little bit in terms of his his uh, link up play to the midfield. Um, yeah, he, he's getting a lot of good coverage, and he's he's well liked in France. So good on following. Let's hope it carries on. Good. Long may it continue. Uh, friend of the pod, Jason Schrader, asked to you, Josh, uh, is your Europa League campaign for us trophy or bust? I think with the signings we're going after for our quote-unquote B team, it looks like we're going for the Europa League title, to be honest. It looks to be set up that way that we've got, unlike some teams, we've got two chances at getting Champions League football. And when you look at who made the final last year, I know what will happen in our year is you know someone like Atletico, Sevilla, Real Madrid, Barcelona rejuvenated will all drop into Europa League from Champions <laughs> League. <laughs> Liverpool will be there, Man City will be there, every team. And they'll, be, they'll all be in it. They'll all be in the Europa League and we'll all get fucked. Um, <laughs> but seriously i think there is a real opportunity for us there and it's not mentioned enough how we don't have as 
we need to improve our European pedigree, is what I would say. As a club of our stature, we should have a better European history than we do. Um, and there are many reasons for it. Um, some related to uh, the most decorated uh, Europe or team in England in regarding European trophies, um, getting us banned from the competitions when we probably had one of our best squads um, all those years ago, uh, which probably stopped us winning a few European trophies. But um, yeah, I, I think there's an opportunity for us now and I think we should really be going for it. And you can see the players that we've got in place we've got a squad even a b team squad that should be getting us to easily the semi-finals yeah i agree with that i think we've got to be aiming to try and win that competition yeah i think it's it, it's at the very least latter stages but yeah we should absolutely be be pushing for it um and controversial opinion i would rather win that than finish fourth personally i mean it gets you in anyway doesn't it if you mm. win it but yeah i would rather us take a piece of silverware and that, that you know that Valencia game where we we all believed, didn't we? And, and mm. it, you know, obviously didn't end well, but we we were all on that train at the end of that season, and I want to feel that again. So yeah, I agree with that. I do agree with that. Same, I concur as well. I think we need to go out for it. I think Josh is really right when he says we need to do improve our European pedigree. You know, a club of Arsenal stature should have. Yeah. Well, we definitely should have won the. Um, the Champions League, I can think of two occasions. One would play Barcelona and that season where we lost to Chelsea and then they lost oh. to um um Mark, no, they lost to Porto. I Porto, feel like yeah. that was opportunity because we if we beaten Chelsea, we would have beaten Porto. Like yeah. And yeah, we, you know, we would have ruined Jose Marina's legacy because he never would have been the person who he, he is because he never would have gone to Chelsea and he still would have been Porto. So it is what it is. But um yeah, I agree. Okay, last question is from Bo Blex. It's from the Discord. He says, with the Saliba song stuck in most of our heads, here's a question. How many of our players now have songs? We'll Blitz. find out on Saturday, I think. I haven't, <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't been for long enough, but yeah, I, uh, is Cedric got a song? I don't <laughs> There's I quite a few, imagine. isn't there? I think, I think Ramsdale hasn't got one, so he probably needs one soon. That I can think of, he probably has, but I can think of. Constitutes... I think it doesn't matter anymore, does it? Because the only no. song we've got is Saliba's song. And so we're saying pre pod. <laughs> this song, is true. I mean, if you just crowbar a name into a song, like you know, like oh, Aaron, 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 Aaron Ramsdale. Is it's still song? a song, isn't it? Like, like you're still well, singing. Yeah, yeah. Like the fact that we were singing Granite Jacker's name, and then the whole time that I've. Granite Jacker's been at Arsenal. I can never, I've never heard that. time no. people singing Aaron, uh, sorry, Granite Jacker's name. So yeah. congratulations to him. Like <laughs> Yeah, I have never I've never heard that. And and of yeah. course we we've sung other opposition managers' names in like Vieira's case as well. The, the yeah. Zinchenko one Zinchenko is my yeah. yeah, the, the Zinchenko one is my personal favourite. I, I actually prefer that over the Saliba one just because it, it just it just goes, doesn't it? It's just that. Zinchenko, it's just great, uh, and I'm a big fan of Spanish ballet because I'm old. So uh, yeah, I like that one. But now I'll be interested. I'll, I'll be, I'll be really interested to see what the atmosphere is like on on Saturday. And um, I don't, yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously if we win, it'll be great. But it, it's that awkward time, isn't it? As well, the five thirty game, whatever it is. The nights are uh, sadly starting to draw in a little bit. So I guess we'll get some under the lights type of feel in the second half in particular. So. so basically what I'm hearing, Chris, if we've won three games in a row and you haven't attended any games, if we yeah, now I'm lose aware of this. and you've attended, I know. then... I know. Yeah. I know. I'm trying not to think about it, so thanks for that. But yeah, <laughs> I am fully aware that if... I mean, well, th that said, Jace is going as well. This so is true. For the watch just one blame day. Jace. Yeah, I mean, he's just going to shout at them. If they wouldn't lose at half time, you can just yeah. shout at them. I might just Sorry. quietly slip out if it's not going well and just head back home. And <laughs> But yes, uh, uh, I'm staying overnight, so at least I've got somewhere to get my head down if it all goes Pete Tong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, right, I think we will draw it there then because um, we've gone technically 15, maybe 20 minutes longer than we planned to anyway, but a uh, good conversation. So we thought we'd treat you a little bit. If we can't treat you when things are going well, when can we treat you? But probably back to normal next week with a, an hour hour and 15 max so um enjoy it while you got it 
you freeloading scumbags. But uh, in all seriousness, thank you very much to everybody who has joined us this evening. Lots of familiar names there, a couple of new ones as well. Um, you don't need me to remind you, but you know what I'm going to say. Uh, hit the old subscribe button, uh, pop the old thumbs up on the YouTube video if that is where you are taking us in. We appreciate it. Um, obviously, follow the socials and all that good stuff. Uh, we will be back with the preview show before the Fulham game. I think Danny's just put in our WhatsApp group uh, about doing a show about the draw for the uh, Europa League, which I think he's going to do with John on Friday. So look out for that as well. But that is us done. We've got places to be. We've got food to make. And uh, Josh has got a temperature to find again. So um, we are going to exit stage left. Josh, thank you for coming on. I know you're not feeling the hottest right now. So thank you for being on time and being present for us. Much appreciated. Oh, don't worry. I'm definitely feeling hot now. Um, I am very sweaty. Um, but it's all right. It's what a lovely been great image. Back. I know, right? Everybody can enjoy that view um, and thought take them away and hopefully get rid of whatever they saw being Carl's picture when he turned his uh, webcam off. Yeah, speaking of sweaty balls. Uh, <laughs> Carl, thank you for, uh, for coming on tonight, mate, and I shall uh, hopefully see you on Saturday. Yes, we'll talk on Saturday. Do you know what the thing is, Chris? You, Thank you for reminding me. I thought it was a three o'clock game, so I was gearing myself <laughs> up for a three o'clock, but now it's five. I'm going to have to change it for a couple of plans. So I would arrive at the Emirates it's like, where the fuck is everyone? Where right? is everyone? Am, right? am, am I getting the game? Like, what's going on? So <laughs> just, just sat on just, your tub. That's just, Weep. yeah, change my plans. But yeah, I'll definitely, we're talking on WhatsApp group, but I'll definitely meet up with you and see what yes. Andrew's doing. And also, yeah, I think Andrew's coming. I think Simon is going to pop by for a bit as well. So uh, I, I, I get into London around about midday and then I've got to cart my bags over to the Wembley area to drop my stuff off and then I'll head back in. So I should be around about two o'clock, all being well. So uh, yeah, yeah, look forward to fine. seeing you. Um, but that is it as we arrange our social plans. That's it for AVW. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it as ever. Thank you to the chat. Thank you to all the subscribers and all of you who just pop your head in and say hi. We appreciate you. We love you. Keep it Arsenal. We'll speak to you very soon. Take care. And as always, hashtag fuck Ellis. Naturally. <laughs> <laughs>